Now I'll be preaching from the book of Ruth, chapter number one, and I want to begin reading my text, if I could please, in that chapter, in verse number six. So, then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab how that the Lord had visited his people in giving them bread. Wherefore she went forth out of the place where she was, and her two daughters-in-law with her. And they went on their way to return unto the land of Judah. And Naomi said unto her two daughters-in-laws, Go, return each of you to your mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. And the Lord grant you that you may find rest in each of you in the house of, your husband, of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voice, and they wept. And they said unto her, Surely we will return with thee unto thy people. Now skip down to verse number 14. And they lifted up their voices and wept again. And Orpha kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clave unto her. Thank you. That'll be all the scripture I read. Let me get right into my thought today. Elimelech and his wife Naomi were about 40 years old when they left Bethlehem, Judah, and took the 50-mile journey to a place called Moab. They had two sons that accompanied them to Moab, and both of them were figured to be under the age of 20 upon their arrival as a family in this distant land. Malon would have been the oldest by name because he's listed first, or it is a possibility that him and Kelon were twins. But Malon married a woman of Moab named Ruth. Kelon married what many theologians believe was her sister, and her name was Orpha. During their stay in Moab, many negative situations begin to arise, including that Naomi had to bury her son, or excuse me, her husband. And then while she was still in Moab, she had the tragic experience of burying both of her sons. The names of her two sons describe them as being sickly, weak, wasted, unhealthy. Thus, neither one of them were able to produce children because of their health problems. So Naomi is now 50 years old and she's tired of the wasted years that she's invested in a corrupt land. So she returns with her desire and attention set back to going to Bethlehem, Judah. The Bible is very clear that her and her two widowed daughter-in-laws began the journey back to Naomi's homeland. Though it was only 50 miles from Moab back to Bethlehem, Judah, it's very rough and rugged terrain. Normally, it would take anywhere from 7 to 10 days just to travel this 50 miles because of the landscaping. It was a mountainous strip of property in the land of Jordan. So all three of them left Moab, and I don't know how far they are on their journey. I don't know if they're a day's journey in, a two-day, or maybe even five. I don't know. But somewhere along the journey, Naomi decides to send her daughter-in-laws back to Moab. She even provides for them excuses and reasons why they need to abort their journey and return to their pagan land and their pagan families. When you skip down to verse number 14, you remember up in verse 10, they said, oh no, we're going back to Bethlehem with you. But just four verses later, ultimately, Orpha turns back. But the Bible says Ruth clay to Naomi. It means to be glued to. It means to be attached to. It means become twins. She was the one that said, your land will be my land and your God will be my God. But Orpha turned back and went back to Moab and she falls from the scriptures and she's never mentioned again. She started off right, but somewhere along the journey, she quit. I want to preach today on the subject, I've come too far to turn back now. I've come too far to even think about quitting on God. Quitting is very common in our day. People quit their jobs. People quit their churches. People quit their marriages and think nothing of it. There's four steps to you quitting something that's good in your life. Number one, it begins with a feeling or an emotion. You ever heard anybody say, well, I just feel like. Yeah. Did you know there are seven instincts built in the human body? 
Emotions is one of them. And emotion is the most untrusted instinct that the human has in their body. Yet it's the most common that we lean on. Out of all seven instincts, why would you lean on the weakest one that you have, which is your emotions? Quitting all begins with a feeling or emotion. Then it becomes a mental suggestion. Stage number two. You start questioning everybody and everything. Now the suggestion in stage three of quitting looks for an opportunity to do so. Let me tell you something. A lot of people have turned back and have been looking at the world, lusting after the world, and desiring the world long before they ever turned back to the world. Because they were looking for an opportunity to go. The fourth step is, it's completed once a person makes a decision, I'm quitting. I hear people say this to me all the time, and I can only quote a few for sake of time. I'm not cut out for this Christian walk. How about this one? I'm weary without anything left to put into my spiritual relationship. Well, here's a common one. You think that nobody understands what you're going through. The devil will have you to believe you're the only one that's being treated like this. Therefore, you're justified in quitting. Last year, 11.7 million people quit Christianity last year. There are 380,000 churches in America. 4,000 of them are closing every year. 3,500 people a day left local churches in 2020. 1,700 pastors are leaving the ministry every month in America. 1,300 pastors were run off of their churches every month in 2020. 11% of all pastors are depressed. Another 13% are filled with anxiety over watching so many people in their congregation quit. Now, as a national survey, a pastor only stays four years or less in church, and when he leaves the church, most of them quit going to church themselves. So why are so many people turning back to what they come out of? Why are so many people quitting on God? In the nine years that I've been here, if we had everybody here that's been through this church since I've been here, we would cover this whole 14 acres of land and they'd still be parking down the parking lot. So where are they at? Some of the very people that invited you to come here have quit. Some of the very people that were instrumental in getting you saved don't even go to church now themselves. Why are so many people going back? So today I'm preaching on the reason People go back. Next week, I, Lord willing, I'm going to preach on the results of turning back. And then, Lord willing, the week after that, I'm preaching on the reward of not turning back. But today, for a few minutes, I want to tell you why so many people quit. I hope it will help you to understand. Statistics says the average Christian life of a Christian being fired up for the Lord is a meager three years. After that, they begin to be unfaithful, get their priorities mixed up, and eventually drift away from God and the church. So why have so many people quit? It's easy to just throw your hands up and say they're quitters. But biblically, in Ruth chapter number 1, I can tell you exactly why Orpha started off right, but never finished right. Let me mention a few of them to you quickly. Number one, it could have been that she wasn't saved. Now, that's flippant for me to say that, but it's proven in the Scripture. Because in verse number 15, here's what Naomi said. When you go back home, you're not only going back home to your family, you are going home to your gods. The reason why Orpha had no problem leaving Naomi and going back is because she never knew the God that Naomi knew. It was nothing for her to turn back. That's why Peter said, the pig that was washed has returned to its wallowing in the mire and the dog has returned to its own vomit. The reason why it has happened is because their nature was never changed. You may have changed their environment, you may have changed their location, but the hog is still a hog and a dog is still a dog and when they have the opportunity, they go right back to what they came out of. Now, they'll give you a thousand excuses why they quit, 
and they'll blame everything from the preacher down. But ultimately, many people quit and never walk with God consistently because they've never been saved. Now, during the judgment of the nations, during that period of time, God illustrated nations by two animals. Those that were against Israel, anti-Israel, will be called goats on the day of the judgment of the nations. Those that were pro-Israel, according to the Bible, will be called sheep. See, God identifies his children as sheep and those that are lost as goats. So I begin to study. I didn't have much time left. I've done so much reading this week. I studied three things about goats and sheep that are different that I never really thought of. Number one, goats have beards, but sheep do not. I never knew that. I was never really cared, but <laughs> goats have beards. Number two, sheep have what they call a split upper lip, but a goat does not. But the one that caught my attention was their tail. A goat's tail always points up, but a sheep's tail always heads downward. So I'm going to preach a message on... <laughs> I don't even have to tell you. I'm going to preach on, excuse me, your tail showing. Because, because if you're a real sheep and you get around preaching... You accept it, you stay with it, you're calm with it. But if you're a goat in nature, that tail's sticking straight up. And you can take a goat and you can curl it with a curling iron. You can spray their tail down with hairspray. You can even super glue it. But you're not changing his nature. And I'm telling you, there is a difference in the nature of the people of God and the people of this world. Now, the people of this world may start on the journey, but because they're in the flesh and not in the spirit, they will not continue. They will get tired. They will get weary. Instead of looking forward to what they have coming, all they think about is how rough it is and what they're going through. And ultimately, they quit on God because they've just never been saved. About 95% of this crowd you think's backslidden just needs a dose of old time Holy Ghost conviction and get born again It solve their problem. Maybe she wasn't saved. Maybe she turned back because she wasn't saved. What are you going to do in verse number 8? Maybe she turned back because she loved her sin. You know what land she went back to? She went back to the land of Moab. You know where the land of Moab came from? Ten generations back. Her father-in-law, her, excuse me, her grandfather, ten generations back, got drunk with his two daughters and had sex with them. That's called incest. That's called perversion. That's called sickening. And he had sex with his two daughters. One of them had a boy and named him Amnon. Ammon. And the other one had a boy and named him Moab. You know why she went back to Moab? She loved her sin. She loved her ungodliness. She loved her filth. She loved her perversion. This goes all the way back to Genesis chapter number 19 when Lot committed that unseemly sin. This is why the Lord includes the attitude of repentance in the offer of grace for salvation. As long as people love their sin, they will never love Jesus. Paul said they'll be lovers of pleasure more than they are lovers of God. And when people are more worried about what sin they can live in than going to heaven when they die, you might as well leave them alone. They're not ready to get saved, and they'll never make it to Bethlehem, Judah. I can tell you that much. I was reading a book many years ago by uh, Mr. Ironside. And he said in his commentary, he was preaching one night, and a man came forward, and he said, Mr. Ironside, I'd like to get saved tonight, but I'm addicted to this one sin, and I don't not only think I can't stop it, I don't want to stop it. And he said, I want to ask you a question. Do I have to quit it now in order to be saved? He said, you do now, because you have made that an issue with God. I'm going to tell you, when I got under Holy Ghost conviction, I wasn't worried about what I could do, what I couldn't do, where I could go, where I couldn't go, who I could hang with, who I couldn't hang with. When I got my life serious for God, I could care less what everybody else was doing. I wanted to go to heaven more than anything else in the world. And that's when you get bored again. 
And that's why our teenagers are on their feet. And that's why they're clapping in the house of God. Because I didn't give them some easy belief in his nonsense. I say you got to get under conviction. And you got to get born again. Or you'll never make it to heaven when you die. You'll never make it to heaven when you die. Maybe she quit because she loved her sin. Maybe she quit because she was just tired of the struggles. You remember she came from a different religion. Here comes Imelech and Naomi, and they've got two boys that's been raised in Judaism. These boys are Jews. And they're dating women of Moab. And they were filled up with pagan gods in the land of Moab. Maybe there was a fight in the family because of religious disagreements. And that's why the Bible said that believers are not to be un equally yoked together with a non-believer because religion becomes part of your home how are you going to raise your kids what you got him going to one church and one her her going to the other and the kids swapping in between your kids will never live for god that's spiritual suicide for any young kid to have to live in that kind of situation maybe she got tired of fighting over religion maybe ruth was better looking and more likable and or forgot jealous and there was drama in the family. Anybody ever had drama in their family? Sure you did, yo hag. The reason why you ain't laughing, you're the drama of your family. She just got tired of the fussing and the fighting. Think about it. Her husband was dead by the time she was 30. Not only did he leave her as a widow, but because he was sickly in his body, she was carrying the reproach of being childless which was a large reproach back in Bible days. Maybe she got tired of listening to Naomi complain about whether I need to stay here or whether I need to go back or what her future was going to be. You see, the Bible says in Daniel chapter 7 and verse number 25 that in the last days, this world, listen, listen, listen to this, will wear out the saints. So here's what the devil will do to you if you're not careful. If he can't get you to bail out, blow out, or back out, he'll just get you to wear out. Everybody's got struggles. Everybody's got problems. And you've been fed some false facade that if you get right with God, all of that goes away. That sounds good on television, but it's not reality in the lives of everyday Christian people. There's struggles. There's problems. You can love God and your car still blow up on you. You can love God and still lose your job. You can love God and your mother-in-law still want to move in your house. You can love God and a lot of things go wrong. A lot of things can go wrong. And if you're not careful, you will allow those struggles to get between you and God. And all of a sudden, you're so consumed in the negative that you fail to look at the positive. And it's dreary me. And you're on antidepressants. And you smother when you go to sleep. And you're eat up with anxiety. And you're filled with depression. And you're whole life is doom and gloom and you don't want to turn the lights on you want to lay in bed pull the cover over your head let the whole world go by you're facing physical problems and the next thing you know you just say I'm so tired with all of it I quit but let me tell you something I know as a prophet quitting will never make your problems go away they will only intensify your problems Maybe she quit because of just the struggles. Maybe she didn't go all the way because she couldn't see her future. Now look, let's go back ten generations. If her and Ruth were sisters, ten generations back was Lot. Okay? So she's inherited through her DNA the attributes of Papa. So what was Lot's great failure in the Bible? It wasn't when he went to Sodom. It's when he looked at the well-watered plains and decided, I'm going that direction. Long before he ever entered the gate of Sodom, he looked at the immediate. Abraham said, look, we're not going to fight. We be brethren. I want you to choose what parcel of land you want, and I'll choose the rest. Abraham was looking at his future and his spiritual walk with God. Lot was looking at the very immediate. So she was raised to make decisions on what you see now. So the only thing Orpha could see now was 50 miles of mountains, 50 miles of valleys, 7 to 10 days of the Mideastern sun beaming down on them, crossing a wilderness and the Jordan River to get back to Bethlehem, Judah. And when she began to look at all of that, her immediate surroundings 
when she looked what was in front of her, she forgot to see what was going to happen to her. Could you imagine what would have happened had she stayed with Naomi? She would have been out in the field too. Somebody would have come after her too. She would have been married too. She could have been in the genealogy of Jesus too. She could have been in the heavenly lineage of David. He, she could have been a descendant of Jesse. She could have been in the story of Jesus. But because she was just looking at how rough it is now, she forgot that she was standing on the brink of a miracle. And just over the next mountain, God had something supernatural for her. I'm going to tell you what the Bible says. If we have hope only in this world, the immediate, we are of all men most miserable. But why are we happy when the economy's falling apart? Why are we happy when politicians are falling apart? Why are we happy when Joe Biden's the president? It's because I'm not looking at the now. I'm looking at the next mountain. I'm looking at that city whose builder and maker is God, where the lamb is the light, and we live in a mansion. That's what keeps me going. But if you look at the immediate, if you only look at the now, you'll quit on God. You're giving up steps away from the greatest miracle God ever wants to perform in your life. I was reading some time ago about the gold rush in California. It started in 1848, and it went to 1855. People came from everywhere to get in on this gold rush. That's what made California boom. And so a Mormon came from over in Utah and became one of the richest gold diggers in California. And people came from everywhere, and people began to invest, buy mountains, buy caves, and a young multi-millionaire investor from up north bought a mountain, the side of a mountain in California. He sent a crew down there, sent all the equipment, everything was brand new. And he went down through there and he began to pull gold out of that mine. He became a multi-millionaire just feasting off the yellow gold that was coming through the side of that mountain. But he went through a dry spell. He went for three weeks without one shred of gold, Brother Greg. And he told his team, we, we've dug in this mountain. If we, if we don't strike gold in another week, we've harvested it. It's over. We're going to shut it down. I'm done. So another week goes by and nothing but dirt and rock and clay. So we decided to sell the mine. Nobody was interested in it because everybody had heard that he got all the gold out of it. So it sat there. Finally, there was an old maintenance man that was living close to where the mine used to function. He offered the fellow literally pennies for the mine and all the equipment that was now rusty and stiff, and he sold it to him. The old maintenance man found some miners that had got hurt on the job, and therefore, those that got hurt, nobody would hire them. So this old maintenance man broke down, picked up some rusty equipment, hired some handicapped miners, and they opened up the mine again. He dug 21 inches into that mountain. 21 inches into that mountain and found the biggest vein of gold that's ever come out of California. When word got back to the young multi-millionaire in the Northeast that his mine had struck that vein of gold, it so devastated him, he killed himself. And he said, I can't believe I stopped 21 inches from the glory you going through a dry spell in your life you feel like nothing's going on everything's dark everything's damp there's no glitter there's no sparkle there's no light it doesn't seem like there's anything going on everything's kind of dormant in your life you know what I'm talking about you can't feel God it's kind of hard to read your Bible your prayer closet seems like it's kind of dry and dead you say I just think I'm gonna sell out I don't think there's anything left in this don't you stop now you may be 21 inches from the greatest thing that God ever had planned for you in your life you keep him going you keep plowing you keep digging you keep working God will show up Woo! God 
will show up and give you a miracle. Wow. Why did she quit? She was looking at the immediate and not her future. I want to close with this. Why did she quit? Because of the sorry testimony of others that claim to know God. So here's Naomi living in Moab for 10 years. She's living in a pagan land. Everybody around her is worshiping pagan gods. Nowhere in the Bible does it ever say, Brother Varner, that she built an altar or the family ever prayed. You don't find it anywhere in the Bible. Then all of a sudden, after living just like them for 10 years, she said, I'm going to Bethlehem, Judah, which means the place of bread, the house of God. Now, here's a woman that's been acting like them, talking like them, living like them, dressing like them for 10 years. And all of a sudden, she's going to get religious and try to take me to church with her. But they had, they had no confidence in her because of the testimony she had left behind. Let me tell you why some people quit on God. It's because they look up to other Christians that should be seasoned, consistent, transparent, honest, clean, vocal about Christ. And, and young Christians start looking up to them as an example only to find out they're shacking with a woman, screwing around on their wives, social drinking on Saturdays, smoking pot out in their backyard. You think somebody's going to have confidence in your Christianity? You're dumber than a box of rocks. You ought to sue your brain for non-support. Nobody's going to have any confidence in you. You can't look like the world, smell like the world, act like the world, and expect the world to have confidence when you try coming to them and inviting them to the house of God. So, I'm done. In uh, 2020, they had the Olympics in Japan. It's called the Tokyo Olympics. That was last year, 2020. There was a young lady, she was born in Nigeria, but she was living, I think it's Norwegian. She was a young lady, her name is Safan Hassan. Young, beautiful black lady. And brother, could she run? And her life's dream was to be in the Olympics in Tokyo in 2020. So they have what they call a heat race, which, Brother Manus, it's really a race of elimination. The slower ones are left behind, and the quicker ones go to the Olympics. So this is Safan's day to shine. She has run her whole life through jungles and dirt roads, gymnasiums, workout centers, her whole life is now geared for this one 1,500-meter race that will put her to qualify into the Olympics. She lines up with 45 women from 25 different nations. It's four laps around this large running circle that they have to compete. So... Safane starts off, and she stays kind of toward the back of the middle of the pack. And her intentions were, when they finish the third lap and they start the fourth, she's going to turn the afterburner on and smoke this whole crowd. So they cross the line for the third time, knowing the next time around, Brother Randy, would be breaking the ribbon. She kicks in the high gear and doesn't go very far at all. You can watch this on the Internet. She doesn't go very far at all to a runner in front of her trips. And when she trips, Safan runs into her and flips. This is the last lap. And she not only falls, she flips. It would have been a perfect time for her to say, I quit. And the reason why I'm quitting is somebody else messed me up. Somebody else messed me up, so I quit. I know I've been in it three-fourths of the time, but I'll tell you something. Somebody else has messed me up. I had good intentions. I wanted to finish the race, but I'll tell you what. I've got tripped up, and I quit. I'm going to tell you what that little girl did. When she hit that woman, it knocked her down. She tumbled and got back up and put that thing in overdrive. <laughs> 
son, they're a third of the circle around her. You can watch it on the internet. The other women, while they're focusing on her, you can't even see them. They're so far ahead of her. But she doesn't quit because somebody else messed her up. She doesn't quit because she's embarrassed that she fell. She didn't throw in the towel because you imagine the millions of people watching you fall. But she knew if she stayed down, they'd forget the three laps when she gave it her all. And all they remember was she fell before she finished. And she got up and kicked that thing in overdrive and took off down that front aisle. And brother, when they got in that bin, here she was catching up with the pack. When they got halfway down the last straightaway uh, on the back side, she's two-thirds of the way in front of the pack. When they come into the last corner, she's in third place now. When they're coming down the last stretch and the ribbon's pulled, guess who the first one is to break the ribbon and go across the line? Yeah. A little girl named Safab that determined I may have fallen. I may be embarrassed. I may have made a mistake. I may have let somebody else mess me up. But I tell you what I'm doing. I'm getting back up. I'm not quitting. And she ran in the Olympics because she refused to quit. I may mess up along the way. I may fall along the way. People may hurt me along the way. But I tell you what I'm doing. I'm getting right back up again. And I'm getting... I'm going to run till I finish. Let's give the Lord a head clap of praise.